turn. Whoops, I'm not on. I'm on? Hello, am I on? Lean into it. Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Pam Whitcliffe. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of this congregation, and welcome to everybody here. The Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart is a welcoming community, encouraging religious freedom, nourishing individual spiritual and ethical growth, celebrating diversity, and promoting a just and sustainable world. If you'd like to learn more about this fellowship, please look at our website at uufe.org and join us after the service for coffee hour and probably some cake because <laughs> we got some cake left over. For the listening enjoyment of all, we ask that at this time that you please turn off your cell phones and pagers or at least put them to vibrate, vibrate. Yeah, buzz. <coughs> also, <coughs> if you need any hearing support, please ask for help at the sound desk. And thank you all. Enjoy this morning. I'm not as tall as Sam. Hi, I'm Judy Darnell, and I am here with the announcements from the Fellowship Life. First of all, many thanks to Chuck Bauer, Joan Claiborne, Pam Wycliffe uh, for preparing and hosting our wonderful welcome back party yesterday. There were at least 65 in attendance, plus a dog. And we ate well, sang well, and visited with old friends, new friends, and visitors. Well done. Make a note on your calendar to submit all the news that you would like to share in the Focus newsletter. The deadline is Wednesday. So, UU Feasters will meet at 11.30 Wednesday, May 25th, at Trade Winds, 921 West McKinley in Mishawaka. RSVP to Mary Adams by tomorrow, and information is in the church directory. If you are in need of extra support, the care committee is here to help in any way they can. Contact the members Mary Adams, Steve Kripe, Karen Kripe, Mary Karen, Mark Fisher, Pet Cook, or call the church office and leave a brief message and a committee member will return your call. Chalice Sparks is a UU camp for all ages and will be held at Camp Friedenwall near Cassopolis from July 8th to 10th. Regular camp activities will take place as well as UU worship. You may stay in their lodge or take advantage of their tent and RV camping spots. More information is available on Ivy Island. And uh, there is one pamphlet left. It might be wise to just take down the uh, email address or whatever and, and contact uh, Michelle Richards that way. A couple of our younger congregants know that when they get bored, I will accompany them to the minister's office where there is a set of Legos and have fun building and talking. But there will be Sundays when I will be unavailable to be the Lego buddy. So I'm asking for a couple of people to uh, become fellow Lego buddies. Please talk to me during coffee hour or email me this week. And my information is also in the directory. A couple of June events are coming up. The first is the Moral March on Washington, which is scheduled for June 15th. Bus transportation is available. So you can Google Moral March or the Poor People's Campaign for more information. Uh, but Mike has more information about some of that, I think, in the, in the yeah, next focus. Uh, the second of, event, of course, is the UUA General Assembly, and registration is not yet closed. There's information about lodging and other matters at the UUA website. If you would like to attend the event in Portland, Oregon, so uh, an online option is also available. Other information about workshops and other events will be forthcoming. I believe we still need two delegates for the conference, and it's important because this way our voice is heard at GA and on matters that are of importance to our denomination. The media sale in the gathering place ends today with a half price sale. Be sure to check things out and to latch on whatever catches your eye before other shoppers do. Proceeds benefit UUFE. And thank you to those of you who have added to our food pantry supplies. A few things from each of of a bunch of us makes a great difference in how we can help our neighbors in need. And uh, you know, if you don't know, we have that little box out by the side of the road where people can stop by and get what they need when they need it. So uh, we try to stock it three times a week. Last week's offering brought $122 to share with the Boys and Girls Club of Goshen. This week's collection will again be shared with them. Thank you very much.
of service, but there it is. So. We ring the gong three times. Once for those who came before us and made a place for us. Once for those of us who are here now. And once for those who will follow us and build on the dream. Today's chalice lighting was adapted from the Upanishads, which is a sacred Hindu text, 1000 to 500 BC. We light this chalice to help us move from untruth to truth, to help us move from ignorance to wisdom, to help us move from animosity to love, and to help us move from bondage to freedom. We rededicate ourselves before this light to affirm and practice truth, wisdom, love, and freedom today and in the days to come. Now we have a hymn. No. Oh, no, we have Unison Covenant. Sorry. Um, love is the spirit of this church. And service is its law, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This is our covenant. Now we have it. Yeah. Hymn number 203, Creatures of the Earth and Sky, verses 1 through 3.
many of us who have um, shared the Unitarian Universalist traditions for a long time remember that there is in the living tradition we share which draws from many sources in the front of our hymnal and it talks about various religions various um, various ways to um, gain our insights for living today we're going to collect the um, Yes, the offering now. Joan and I are going to pass the offering plates. And then we'll discuss some more about the living tradition. Unitarian minister Kathleen, Kathleen McTeague writes regarding Oliver's theology, by that word theology, we mean not only that her poems reflected her beliefs about a higher power, but what they reflected about a host of other deep questions. What is holy? Who are we? What are, what are we called to do with our lives? And what is death, and how do we understand it as we turn our faces toward its inevitability? If we ever allow ourselves to think of such things, we realize that they are questions that matter to all of us. And the approach taken by Mary Oliver in her poems seems to resonate. What is it about her poetry that resonates with so many of us? First of all, I'd like to ask a question. I will stop right here. How many are familiar with the poetry of Mary Oliver? We 
can all three raise your hands. Um, I'm sure that as we go through this today, you will recognize some of the poetry, maybe not recognize the fact that it was from Mary Oliver. There is a sense of communing with nature in a raw, earthy, sensual manner that our world in this computer age has difficulty accessing. Here's a quote from the Krista Tippett on Being interview with Mary Oliver in 2015. When asked about her religion or spirituality while growing up, she revealed that she had thought hard about the subject but would not allow herself to be pigeonholed. I have no answers, she said, but I have some suggestions. <laughs> I know that a life is much richer with a spiritual part to it. And I also think nothing is more interesting, so I cling to it. As we will see, her spirituality came from being in nature and re realizing that humans are all part of that web of life which is spoken about in the seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism. This may explain at least part of the attraction for Unitarian Universalists. Yes, life is to be lived to the fullest, according to Mary Oliver, and her poetry hints at how this could be. She insists that there is an attitude we need to have toward life if we are to experience it fully. Consider one of the most famous poems, Wild Geese. How many of you heard, have heard of Wild Geese? Oh, yes. <coughs> Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscape, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air <coughs> are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination and calls to you, like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Phrases such as the world offers itself to your imagination and announcing your place in the family of things makes us feel welcome as unique members of this confusing and jumbled world. We do not need to perform some otherworldly ritual, such as walking on our knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting, as some religions must have us believe, to deserve our place. We only have to let the soft animal of our bodies love what they love. Thomas Mann, in his book, God of Dirt, quotes this passage from her essays in Winter Hours. She says, now I think there are only, is only one subject worth my attention, and that is the recognition of the spiritual side of the world, and within this recognition, the condition of my own spiritual state. I am not talking about having faith necessarily, one hopes to, but I mean by spirituality is not theology, but attitude. Thomas Mann then responds with, The heart of natural spirituality is not what one thinks about God, but who one relates to in the natural world. Paying attention is a form of prayer for Mary Oliver within this natural world. She defines prayer from this perspective in her poem, Praying. She says, just pay attention, then patch together a few words, and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but a doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. All of nature speaks to her. 
In her poem, One or Two Things, she writes, The God of Dirt came to me many times and said, So many wise and delectable things. I lay on the grass listening to a dog voice, a crow voice, a frog voice that says now. He said, and now. And he never once mentioned forever. Thomas Mann in his text states that Mary Oliver is saying that she needs that we need to attend to what is now rather than pine for what is forever. By paying attention, she perceived the world around her as the voice of creation. Each plant, beast, and bird had a message, a thought that would illuminate the heavens and the life we live here. It is from the dirt that we all came. So it is not in any derogatory sense that she spoke of the God of dirt. In fact, it is with highest praise and recognition that she was able to commune with nature and hear the voices of the God of dirt. As a contemporary proverb puts it, some people long for eternal life, but then they don't know what to do with time on their hands on a given Sunday afternoon. <laughs> this longing for forever prevents our enjoyment of the now, and Mary Oliver listened to the voices of nature to be present with it. This listening to the silence of the world and hearing its voice is a common theme in many religions. It's one of the founding foundations of uh, the Buddhist belief system, and the concept of being here now is a familiar Buddhist theme. Quieting the thoughts of our minds enables us to hear the essence of our being. And not simply our own thoughts about our being. This type of medication can open doorways to our authentic self, the self that uses no words. Oliver alluded again to this in her poem, The Notebook. The turtle doesn't have a word for any of this. The silky water the enormous blue morning, or the curious affair of his own body. Sometimes it is the silence that reveals the spirit. Sometimes it is the silence that reveals our relationship with nature, within the realm of nature. She closes that poem, The Notebook, with these words. There is still time to let the last rose of sunrise float down into my uplifted eyes. Where, where does this take her when she listens in silence, when she pays attention to the natural world around her? Her poem, Mindful, offers us some clues. Every day, I see or hear something that more or less just kills me with delight. It is what I was born for, to look, to listen, to lose myself, inside that soft world to instruct myself over and over in joy and acclamation. She went on to state that these were not the exceptional things, but rather just the drab, everyday things that she was mindful of that brought her such delight. The world is filled with wonders, and it was her lifelong task to find them. She stated that this is her work in her poem, The Messenger. This standing still and learning to be astonished is my job. It is from the realm of nature that she drew comfort and strength. After the death of her spouse, Mary Malone Cook, she wrote several poems on grieving. In the poem, After Her Death, she wrote about feeling lost. The trees keep whispering, peace, Peace, and the birds in the shadows are full of bodies of small fishes and are content. They open their wings so easily and fly, so it is still possible. We get the sense that nature is in communion with all creation, including humans, especially in our time of need. In the poem Heavy, she closes with these words, how I linger to admire, admire, admire the things in this world that are kind and maybe also troubled. 
roses in the wind, the sea geese on the steep waves, a love to which there is no reply. Her grief was palpable, and yet she found a way through it in the world she saw around her. There was much wisdom in her poetry. Her contemplation of the natural world around her enabled her to gather strength when experiences were difficult to handle. This contemplation also gave access to joy and praise as she observed the life and the flora and fauna around her. She offered a perspective on life that few acknowledge deeply. It does not matter how long life is lived to enable offering joy and love to others, making the world full and good. In doing so, she flipped the sorrow of loss into a recognition of gratitude for life and the experiences that life offers. So back to our rhetorical question. What is it about Mary Oliver's poetry that speaks to many Unitarian Universalists? It is perhaps that Mary Oliver was able to speak to us about deep longing to be connected to the natural world and not separated from it. <coughs> is it possible that she is offering a corrective to our Judeo-Christian myth of being created to have domination over the world? That instead we are to be in partnership in living on this planet. Perhaps there is indeed wisdom in the flora and fauna of this earth that is more profound and more revealing about how we are to live and breathe our days. Upon hearing of Mary Oliver's passing in January 2019, the past poet laureate of the U.S., Billy Collins, wrote this poignant remembrance of her in the Paris Review. This seems to shed some light on her popularity, not just with Unitarian Universalists, but with every reader of her poetry. Billy Collins says, I did not know Mary Oliver as well as I would have liked. Though our poetry paths crossed, crossed a few times, we were introduced more than once, but it wasn't until the evening of October 2012 that we were brought into close proximity. We were asked to read together at an immense performing arts center in Bethesda, Maryland. I was excited at the prospect of our two readerships convening in one place, but drama of a different sort was on the horizon. Hurricane Sandy was bearing down on coastal Maryland and due to strike later that night. The storm did not deter our readers also, uh, they all showed up, regardless. Our readings went well, each of us showing a natural respect for the other, and the poems themselves, though different in tone and intent, at moments seemed to speak to each other along parallel lines. The audience was generous and quick with applause. But what I remember most about that evening was the book signing that followed. It took place in the theater lobby. Mary and I were seated at adjoining tables, in front of which two long lines formed. We uncapped our pens, and the signing began. Sitting side by side as we were, I couldn't help noticing how emotional many of Mary's readers became at her presence. They gathered around her, um, Oh, they gushed about how much I skipped over the line. They gushed about how much her poems meant to them, how her poems had confronted, <coughs> comforted them in dire times, how they had been saved by her work. The key word there is saved. Many of them, when it came their turn, burst into tears, as if the sight of the poet incarnate was too much to bear. Others, further back in line, dabbed their eyes in anticipation. Meanwhile, what I was getting from my readers was more like, could you sign this to Bob? It's his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> he goes on to say, throughout these outpourings, Mary Oliver kept her cool. 
she exuded a measure of sympathetic understanding to each individual. And I wondered, though, whether she saw that all these emotions were based on a misunderstanding. Was this the audience she had in mind? Were these the reactions she intended to provoke? In an interview with her friend Coleman Barks, she had said that she didn't mean for these to be of comfort to people so much as um, she wanted them to be controversial and incendiary. Her poems confront the fears and terrors of being alive. And yet, though Mary Oliver may have felt herself to be alone on those exploratory morning walks, she had been accompanied by thousands every step of the way. She managed, to paraphrase Wordsworth, to create the taste by which she was enjoyed. She had not merely fans, but true followers. My meditation, to, to wrap this service up, is from Samuel Trumbor. He says, go forth in simplicity, find and walk the path that leads to compassion and wisdom, that leads to happiness, peace, and ease. Welcome the stranger and open your heart to a world in need of healing. Be courageous before the forces of hate. Hope and embody a vision of the common good that serves the needs of all people. The benediction is by Mary Oliver. She says, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time comes, to let it go. Thank you. We're going to have a hymn now though, for the earth forever turning. It's hymn number 163.
And then, when the time comes, let it go. Let it go. There. More bang for the buck. More bang for the buck. <laughs>